BlackRock CEO Larry Fink just published his annual letter to shareholders where he said that it's a bit crazy to anchor our idea for the right retirement age at 65 years old because people are living longer so they need more money in retirement and this is putting more pressure on the Social Security Fund. The Social Security Administration itself says that by 2034 it won't be able to pay people their full benefits. If you retire at 65 and you start pulling money out of Social Security and then you die at 75 that means you're getting Social Security checks for 10 years versus if you retire at 65 and then you die at 95 that's 30 years of social security checks which means it's going to cost a whole lot more money to fund your retirement today if you're married and both you and your spouse are over the age of 65 there's a 50 50 chance that at least one of you will be receiving a social security check until you're 90 and this is why larry fink is proposing to make changes to the retirement plan in the united states because he says well we can look at what some other countries are doing for example the dutch are gradually raising their retirement age and they adjust the retirement age as the country's life expectancy changes. In other words, as people are living longer, you should also be working longer. Now, I've already spent the time reading this letter to shareholders and breaking it down, but if you want to read this letter for yourself, I will link it for you down in the description, but I'm going to break it down today by going over three different parts. Number one, talking about the issues with this current retirement crisis that we're facing. Number two, talking about the proposals that Larry Fink had proposed. And number three, I want you to understand what this means for you and how you can protect yourself and your finances. Now, before we jump into number one, I want to remind you that on April 2nd, 2024, I'm hosting a live free and virtual real estate investing workshop where I'm going to be going over my own real estate investing strategies. I'm going to be going over how I look for a good location to invest in. I'm going to be going over how I find a good property that will cash flow and how do I run the numbers. And finally, I'll go over how I look to maximize the profits on my real estate investment deals. This is a completely free workshop and it's going to be a lot of fun. So if you're thinking about investing your money in real estate or you want to see how you can do your next real estate deal even better, you can come join me on this workshop. All you have to do is register because there's a limited number of people that can join me live. So if you'd like to join me live, I got the link down in the description below. The Social Security Fund in the United States is running out of money and they have come out and said that if changes are not made by 2034, they will have to start cutting their payments. The way the Social Security Fund gets money is every time you go to work to get paid, some of your paycheck is taken out and put into the Social Security Fund. And this tax, the Social Security tax, is separate from your income tax. So let's assume that you make $100,000 a year. Well, what happens out of this one hundred thousand dollars is you have to pay 6.2 percent of your income in social security taxes so six thousand two hundred dollars is going to go to the social security fund and this is what you're paying as the employee but your employer is also paying some money into the social security fund as well let's assume now that you own a company and you're paying yourself a salary of a hundred thousand dollars well if you pay yourself a salary of a hundred thousand dollars well, now you as the employer have to pay 6.2% to the Social Security Fund and you as the employee also have to pay 6.2% to the Social Security Fund, which ultimately means that you're going to be paying 12.4% to the Social Security Fund out of your income. And this is in addition to your income taxes. Now, if you are just an employee, you're not the employer, you're just an employee, you're only paying 6.2%. But you gotta remember, your employer is also paying 6.2%. You just don't see it because that's before you get this income. Which means in theory, you as an employee are also kind of paying 12.4% of your income in social security taxes because if your boss didn't have to pay that 6.2% of your income in social security taxes, they could in theory raise your income by 6.2% because that's just an expense that they no longer have to pay. So you have the 6.2% tax that the employer has to pay and then you have to pay the 6.2% tax. But if you're just an employee, this is all you have to see, but you still technically have to pay for this. It's just not coming out of your paycheck. It's coming out before you get your paycheck. If you are the employer and the employee, well, now you have to pay all 12.4%. But the third thing you want to understand is that this Social Security tax is not applied to all income. It's only applied to your W-2 income up to $168,600, which means, let's say you made a million dollars from your salary because you are a big time CEO, you're an athlete, you're a big time doctor, you make a million dollars. Well, now you're gonna pay 6.2% of your income up to $168,600 and then that's it. 
but your employer also has to pay 6.2% up to $168,600. But above $168,600, you don't have to pay any social security taxes. And this number is as of 2024, and this number changes pretty much every year. The problem here is that the social security fund is paying out more money than they're bringing in in benefits, which essentially means if you're under the age of 45, this money that you're paying in the form of social security taxes is not going to fund your retirement, it's going to fund somebody else's retirement. And and this is where Larry Fink says, all of this is putting the United States retirement system under immense strain. And as a quick reminder, the United States government, including the Social Security Fund, don't earn money. They generate dollars through taxpayers, through tax dollars. So when you hear the Social Security Fund is paying out money, this is money that the Social Security Fund is paying out from the money that they got from taxpayers in the first place. And remember, this is your Social Security tax on top of your income tax. So now that we understand what the issues are, let me outline the proposals that Larry Fink laid out. Humanity has changed over the last 120 years, so must our conception of retirement. Now, I'm not here to tell you what's right or wrong. I wanna leave that decision ultimately up to you. I just wanna lay out what the proposals are because what Larry Fink says is we should look at countries around the world and get inspiration from them because as people are living longer, it's putting more strain on the retirement funds and we need a way to make sure that enough money is going into the retirement funds. In the Netherlands, 10 years ago, they started gradually raising the retirement age and now the retirement age is automatically adjusted as the country's life expectancy changes. Or take a look at Japan because they found new ways to boost their labor force participation rate, which is a metric that has been declining in the United States. So the issue is that the social Social Security Fund is paying out more money than it's bringing in. And this is where Larry Fink says we need to start looking at what other countries are doing around the world to get more money into the Social Security Funds themselves or to help people fund their own retirements. And this is where now Larry Fink gave two proposals. First, for workers, he says making investing almost automatic. Because in 2022, nearly half of Americans between the ages of 55 and 65 reported not having a single dollar saved in personal retirement accounts that includes nothing in a pension, nothing in an IRA, and nothing in a 401k. Now, it's a little unclear what an automatic investment would look like because Social Security is almost like an automatic investment, except your money is invested by the government instead of somebody on Wall Street. But the whole idea of an automatic investment is it's forcing people without their will or choice to save or invest some of their money. And this is where one of the things that he talks about is a target date ETF that BlackRock has been investing their money in, where essentially, if you know when you want to retire, you can invest in one of these funds that will help you fund their retirement when you reach that age. And proposal number two is for retirees help them spend what they have saved. BlackRock manages a big chunk of America's retirement accounts. And they did a study where they looked at 1,150 American retirees and they found that even people who know how to save for retirement still don't know how to spend their money. See, for most people, investing for retirement means building a nest egg. You invest some money into this account and then you hope that when you retire, you're gonna have a million dollars. $5 million, $10 million, whatever your amount might be, but you have this amount sitting in retirement and then you can pull some money out of this account. But unless you're investing for dividends, you don't really have an income. You have to pull money out of this account. And this already talks about a potential for a predictable paycheck-like income similar to a pension. BlackRock is creating their own life path paycheck. So it's almost like a way to stop you from overspending your money because if you have a million dollars in retirement and then you hit 65, you pull out half a million dollars and you blow all of it on this fancy vacation in a home and then you only have half your retirement account left for the rest of your retirement, well, you could be in a little bit of a stressful situation. But if you're limited by how much you can spend, you are more under control of how you spend your money. Good or bad, I'll leave that up to you, just telling you what it is. And this is where I should also mention that Larry Fink also pointed out that, well, he does not have all the answers. These are just some thoughts over the years and decades that he's been working to put this out there. Which brings me now finally to the things that you need to understand where I can finally talk about the things that I wanna talk about because the reality is, you don't want to rely on anybody else. You don't want to rely on the government with social security checks, and you do not want to rely on BlackRock to fund your retirement. What you want to do is to rely on your own investments because if you can invest your money, and you could use ETFs and stuff, but if you invest your money in a way that you know is gonna be able to fund your retirement, maybe you're investing your money for dividends, maybe you're investing your money for rental income, and you know now that if you can invest your money in a way well, now you have full control over how you fund your retirement. You have full control over how you spend your money. You have full control over how you invest your money and you have full control on how you access your money. Nobody has to control how you can pull your money out. Nobody has to control on how you have to spend your paycheck because the reality is a big chunk of people's paychecks are going to taxes. You have your federal income taxes. 
You have your state taxes. You have your social security taxes. You have your Medicare taxes. You have your property taxes. You have your sales taxes. There are a lot of taxes that you have to pay. Now, I agree, investing is important. I also agree that investing is the way for Americans to become financially free. This is the way that our American system works. Hate it or love it, that is a fact. And so if you want to become free, you have to be investing your money. But now, if you can build your own financial education. You don't have to rely on somebody else to tell you how you can get that money. You don't have to rely on somebody else on how much money you can spend. You don't have to rely on somebody else on when you can retire. You can be in control of your own destiny if you can build that financial education. Now, one of the ways I like to invest my money is I like to invest my money for cash flow. And what that means now is if over the course of your investment career, over the course of your working career, you can work to invest a million dollars. Now, you don't necessarily have to put aside a million dollars, although most people in America are gonna be able to earn and put aside a million dollars over the course of their careers because how much money you're making today is not gonna be how much money you're making five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, but if you can invest a million dollars over the course of your career and you can generate some income on this million dollars, maybe you're working to generate dividends, maybe you're working to generate some cash flow from your rental properties, well, now you can live a life off of the income that your assets are producing. For example, when I invest my money in real estate, I look for a 7% cash on cash return. Meaning if I invested a million dollars today, I'm looking for $70,000 a year in cash flow. After expenses, that's profit that hits my bank account and that's without me having to sell this investment. You don't have to invest your money in real estate. You can also invest your money into stocks and invest your money to generate dividends. Now you might say, well, Jaspreet, stocks are not paying 7% dividends, although some are, but the average stock is not paying 7% in dividends. It's only paying two to 3% in dividends. And you're right, but if you can generate these two to 3% in dividends and you start investing a little bit of money today and you keep reinvesting this money, well, guess what? As these companies start to make more money, guess what happens to their dividends? They increase. So now, if you buy a stock today for $100 a share, it's paying out a $3 dividend, a 3% yield. And then a few years go by, and now this stock is worth $200 a share, but it continues to pay out a 3% yield. That means now the stock is paying out a $6 dividend. And so now if you own the stock, you're not getting $3 a year, you're getting $6 a year which means your dividends have effectively increased. But the key here is to be a long-term investor because if you just buy the stock one time, you just invest $100 here, well, you're never gonna get rich off of a $100 investment. The way that you get rich, the way that you build wealth is by consistently investing your money. And so now you buy it here and you keep buying it, you keep buying it, you keep buying it. Every time you get paid, you're buying more of this thing that's paying you with income. You buy more of this thing that's gonna pay you with this cash flow. You're buying more of this thing that's gonna pay you with these dividends. Every time you get this dividend, you reinvest it to buy more cash flow. You buy more cash flow. That way now over the course of 10 years, now you have a bigger nest egg that's working to produce an income for you. Over the course of 20 years, now you have all this income that you were investing and the income that your investments are paying you working to generate you more cash flow. Now, when you do that, you're getting paid without having to work and you have full control over this income and you can spend it however you want. And you also have control over how much income that you're going to generate because you can choose how much money you're gonna invest. You can choose to invest 10% of your paycheck. You can choose to invest 15% of your paycheck. You can choose to invest 50% of your paycheck if you wanna live smaller. You can also choose to work harder, but it starts with a financial education because if you know what you're doing, if you know what you're working towards, well, now you can change what you're doing with your money, which will allow you to become wealthy. See, just forcing people to do something and be blind robots in a system it doesn't teach people how to become wealthy. It doesn't teach people how to become financially free. It doesn't teach people to live a good life financially. It teaches people to become reliant on somebody else. I want you to learn to become wealthy. I want you to learn how to break out of the system. I want you to learn how to stop relying on everybody else. I want you to learn how to use these systems. ETFs are not bad. They are great ways for you to invest your money. In fact, this kind of has to do with what financial education is because if you wanna invest your money into the right assets that are gonna keep paying you, that are gonna be able to grow the amount of cash flow that you're getting, that requires the education of knowing where to invest your money. Because what could happen is you invest your money into this stock right here that's valued at $100 a share, that's paying $3 a year in dividends, and you hope that this is what happens, that it's gonna double, and you're gonna make more cash flow. But what could also happen is this stock goes bankrupt because you invested your money into a company that ran it into the ground. 
but how do you diversify against this risk? This is where now that financial education comes into play. Maybe instead of investing in individual companies, you invest in an index fund or an ETF. That way now you're getting diversification by investing your money into a fund of dividend paying companies. Now, again, I like investing my money for cash flow, which is why I'm focusing on this, but you have to understand now what your goal is. And if you start to build a financial education, now you can start to work towards having the financial freedom that you want, that way you don't have to rely on the government because one of the worst things that you can do is you're 65 or 70 years old. You don't wanna work anymore. You wanna travel the world. And now the things that you can do rely on how big your social security checks are. And this is where a lot of people say, well, Jasprit, can't the government just print more money and fund bigger social security checks? Sure, but we know the consequence of that. The government printed a lot of money to fund those stimulus checks, to fund the unemployment checks, to fund the bailouts for businesses, to fund the PPP loans for businesses. And what happened? People had a lot more money to spend in the short term, but then inflation kicked in and now everything became a whole lot more expensive. So sure, the government could fund bigger social security checks, which will help you feel rich today, but then next year, you're gonna have less spending ability because you can't print more wealth. You can print more money, but you can't print more wealth. And see, that's the difference that a lot of people unfortunately just don't understand, where if you just keep relying on the government to fund things, the government has to get that money from somewhere. And the government only has one source of income. It's through taxpayers, through tax dollars. Sure, they can print the money, which solves it for the short term, but that creates a bigger consequence over the long term. And this is why your financial education is so important. This way you don't have to rely on somebody else to say, we're gonna limit how much money you can pull out of your 401k when you enter retirement. That way we can make sure that you're not gonna spend all of your money when you're 66 years old. Sure, that might make sense for somebody who has no control over their financial spending habits, but for somebody who is financially smart, you don't want somebody telling you how much money you can spend at 66. You wanna be able to spend your money the way that you want. And in order for you to do that, you need to be able to control your own investments. You need to control the way that you use your money. You need to control your own financial education. That way you don't have to rely on the government. You don't have to rely on BlackRock or somebody else to tell you what you can do with your money. That requires you to have that financial education and that financial discipline. Now, there's a lot of ways for you to invest your money. I'm talking about real estate investing. I've talked about stock market investing. I have a real estate workshop. I'll link that for you down in the description. But the key here, is you have to put some of your money to work. You have to understand that there's risks. You have to understand the market crashes happen. You have to understand the market booms happen. You have to understand that you have to keep investing when markets are up and down. And you have to understand that this takes a long time. I talk about the decade of sacrifice. This is not something that's gonna happen overnight. You gotta spend at least a decade of spending less and earning more to really start seeing the impacts of what you're doing. And if you stay consistent with that, you're gonna be able to live your life financially free because now the income from your investments can help fund your lifestyle so you don't have to keep working to generate the income, but it requires the right financial education. I know, got a little bit into a rant in the end of this, but the whole point of this is you need to understand the financial education because if you have the financial education, none of this really matters. You can take care of yourself. And unfortunately, some people are not going to be able to do that. And that's why this is such a unfortunate situation because we are facing a retirement crisis, but you don't wanna be the one that's in that crisis. You don't wanna be a part of that statistic. You wanna be part of the statistic that's living your life financially free. That way you have full control over how you can take care of yourself, your family, and your community. CNBC published an article saying that 61% of Americans are expected to run out of their emergency savings by the end of 2024. This is where I wanted to dig a little bit deeper to see how many people are actually pulling money out of their 401ks due to a hardship withdrawal. And here's what I found. 